Welcome to Straight Up, brought to you by Peak Prosperity, which values context, curiosity, and learning that leads to action. Reading from his latest works and expanding on current events in the economy, energy, and environment, it is my pleasure to introduce your host, Dr. Chris Martinson. Welcome, everyone, to this Straight Up. I'm so pleased to have you here with me today. I'm going to be going through the piece that was posted on Friday, August 9th, 2019. This one is titled The Hard Truth. Why hard assets are so important given the current state of global markets. Well, it's actually more than that. What we're going to be discussing here is how the entire system that everybody is depending on for their hopes and dreams and retirement and what their kids and grandkids are going to have in terms of opportunities, the whole shebang is completely unsustainable because it's based on exponential growth. I know it's a big idea, but we're going to have to go through it. And I know, look, it's very easy these days to get sucked into the mini dramas playing out across our digital screens. This happens to me all the time, right? Trump tweeted this while the stock market did that. Uh Oh, somebody's experiencing something awful over there. Or wait, hey, they're having a stroke of great fortune over there. Oh, look, kittens. You know what? Watching CNN, to me, it often feels like the inept product of a university committee that sought to create a program of sensitivity training for adult sufferers of acute ADHD. You know, after just five minutes, you know what it's like to be trapped in a brain that's distracted partway through every thought pattern and cannot maintain enough attention to form a coherent sequitur. You know, congratulations, CNN, (laughs) or the the sensitivity training committee, because I know what it's like now to experience adult acute ADHD. However, if we set all of these entirely useless distractions aside. It's quite apparent that something big is going on. And it's not positive. You can feel it in your bones. People are worried. We're nervous. There's violence. There's anxiety. What is causing it? That's what we need to talk about today. Because it's none of the things that are being presented in the mainstream media. And it's a complex story with a lot of moving pieces. And it takes a little bit of effort to puzzle it all out. But more and more people are arriving at the same conclusion. Something is going to break. To resolve the dots into a coherent picture, we need to take two giant steps back and take in the whole canvas. The Cliff Notes version is this. The numbers just don't add up. Hey, if you get that, you can click off here, wander on your merry day because you already get it. The numbers, they just don't add up. Big changes, they're actually already underway. Specifically, the unsustainable cogs in the global economy are slowly grinding to a halt. Remember, collapse is a process, not an event. So to understand what's really happening here and why these big changes are happening, we're going to take giant step number one, growth. We have to talk about growth. The age of unrestricted and maybe unexamined growth. It's over. It was a good run. But now we've got to live within certain ecological and resource budgets, which means we've also got to live within some fiscal and economic budgets. Virtually nobody in power wants to do either of those things. Of course not. Well, maybe a few here and there. Most of them retired recently or close to it. The remainder of all the people in power, they want, they all want business as usual to continue, especially those that just hooked a finger around the brass ring of success, right? Oh my God, I just I just became a vice president and a president of a corporation. I just got into Congress. I've just become a tenured university professor. So yeah, uh, keeping business as usual, continuing, that's, that's the most important thing for these people. Now, the big problem, the big problem with business as usual is that it's a broken model without a future. Economic growth was the solution to every problem. Hey, now it is the problem. Worst of all, it's not just growth that we become addicted to, but exponential growth. For a quick and powerful review of this vital concept, I'm going to direct you back to my website at peakprosperity.com. Check out the crash course. Please watch this video. It's chapter four. It's called Compounding is the Problem. It's less than five minutes. Fair warning, you might not be the same afterwards. Lots of people have reported that this chapter in particular, these five minutes actually change their lives and how they think about things. Now, look, there are a hundred exponential charts we could discuss today. They're all important in their own right, but 
there's one that stands out far above them all. It's so prevalent in your life that you probably take it for granted, might not even appreciate all that it provides. You are the fish in this story. This chart points to the water. And here it is. The chart that's being shown at my website is called Cumulative Global Fossil Fuel Use Since 1750. And you know what this chart looks like? A big, long, flat line. It's flat from 1750 to 1800, right along the bottom of the chart. It's like it's 0%. 1850, 0%. 1900, ooh, it's lifting a little. 1950, lifting a little more. And then shoof, shoots right up into the air. And we find on this chart that almost all of the fossil fuel consumptions happened most recently right, in the past few decades. Fossil fuel energy, that's what's responsible for providing every creature comfort and material abundance in your life. And it has been growing exponentially for your entire life. And here's the brain buster. If you squint at this chart carefully, you know what you're going to see? You're going to see that fully half of all the fossil fuels ever burned throughout all of history have been burned since 1990. Wait, did you get that? It means that if you're 29 years old, you have been alive when half of all the fossil fuels ever burned throughout all of human history have been burned. Half in just 29 years, right? People look at this sometimes, they go, oh, you know, Chris, you know, we've fossil fuels, we've been using them for a long time. Steam engines came out, what, in the 1800s? And they don't understand that because we've been consuming fossil fuels exponentially, that we're shortening the doubling times around this, right? So in 29 years, half of all the fossil fuels ever burned in human history have been burned. Now, if that doesn't shock you, then I need you to reread this. I need you to go off and meditate on it. I need you to think about it some more because it's really a very profound insight, especially once I connect it to the second giant step next. But that's coming. Hang on a second. Now, here's another idea. What if we converted the fossil fuel energy that we consume into human slaves? That is, the amount of work that a fit human being could provide if they were digging ditches or crushing stones or hauling a cart, you know, doing things like that, maybe pedaling a bicycle furiously to connect it to an alternator so that you could have lights on in your house. If we did that, except it's the, you know, it's the fossil fuels providing that work energy. What happens if we convert all that fossil fuel energy into human slaves? By this method, we discovered that each year's fossil fuel use is equivalent to 500 billion, with a B, billion human energy slaves working to keep our houses cooled, food on the table, moving ourselves, and all our innumerable goods about the face of the planet. Now, with only 7.8 billion people on the planet today, that's as if there were 64 human energy slaves per person. That would make you... Any average person on the planet have more slaves at their disposal than Cleopatra did. She queen, of course. Queen of, of a, a very large uh, empire at the time. The average person has more energy slaves than Cleopatra, but we're not aware of them because those slaves that Cleopatra had, you know, you still had to feed them, you had to house them, they had to clean themselves, they needed clothing. The slaves that we have, you're not even aware they're there right? Your lights just turn on. The dishwasher just runs. It's just, it's, it's beautiful, but it's also hidden from us. Now, given that those slaves that I just talked about, the 500 billion slaves, they're not evenly distributed, of course. And so there's an average doesn't apply here. And it's more like people in rich countries have several hundred energy slaves each. And maybe people in poor countries just have a couple. Well, listen, that Having hundreds of slaves at your disposal it makes life really very easy, very sweet. And if or when your energy slaves go away, life will become a lot more difficult. But you know what? Not in any ways that would be remarkable to your great-grandparents. When it comes to oil, the data is even more surprising. To have been alive when half of all the oil ever used throughout all of human history has been used. You only need to be 22 years old. 22. That's it. In just the past 22 years, as much oil energy as used throughout all of human history has been used in just the past 22 years. It's moved your personal vehicles about, massive container ships and airplanes. It's oil energy has been used to dig up vast mineral ore deposits. It's installed wind towers as well as spread plastic throughout the oceans. It's trawled and cut and scraped and plowed 
dwindling natural habitats, it's very difficult to overstate just how much material abundance that oil energy has brought to the world. All of it would be closest to the truth. This is water to a fish. We're surrounded by it. Most people are completely unaware of just how much abundance the surplus energy from fossil fuels has brought to us. It's like we were born on third base, but we think we hit a triple. You know, we're just clever. We're clever humans. We'll figure something out. Well, now let's ask a different question. Ask yourself, how long will it be before another volume equal to all of that ever burned out throughout human history up to this point? How long before another volume equal to this moment and all of history in the past will be consumed? That is, I'm asking the question, how long before the next doubling? Another half equal to the last half. How long? Well, at current rates, that's just going to be another 21 years. Weird, huh? But that's how it works. It's the miracle of compounding. Each doubling consumes as much as all the prior ones before it. Now, this is awesome when it works for you in a portfolio. Sneaking and treacherous, though. It's very sneaky and treacherous when it's working against you, as it has for the actuarially deficient pension plans. They're experiencing negative compounding. And that's just utterly destructive, right? Einstein called compounding the eighth wonder of the world. And he said that he who understands it earns it. He who doesn't pays it. Now, look, I know energy extraction. It's a complex arena. I'm not asking you to become a world-class petroleum or coal geologist or anything like that. But merely just use your intuition. How many more doublings of fossil fuel consumption do you think we've got? Do we have one more? Can we manage to find and burn another amount of coal, oil, and natural gas equal to all that has come before? Even if your intuition says that we've got one more doubling, or possibly two, you know there's a hard limit in there somewhere, right? Sooner or later, there's a limit to the exponential extraction and use of fossil fuels. Some days it just becomes too difficult to extract the remaining dregs and dribbles at a faster pace. That's when the peak occurs. Then everything we take for granted changes. The water drains from our tank. We rather suddenly become acutely aware of the water's absence. It's all fun and games when you're adding more energy slaves to the mix. You start subtracting them and it's less comfortable, right? That day though, that day of that peak is not as far off as you might imagine, especially if you read the mainstream news. Right? This is like, this is the most surprisingly important hidden information that exists today. How long do you think that day is? I, I personally, I think it's maybe a decade, maybe two, right? Maybe, maybe, maybe the, the Arctic melts and we discover there's just vast pools of oil under there, but it's out there and it's not that far away. By just by taking that one giant step back and looking at the energy situation, the exponential use of fossil fuel energies, so much becomes clear about the future and what it can and what it cannot offer. One thing we cannot assume any longer is an endless horizon of exponential growth in energy extraction. You can't assume that any longer. With that one insight, literally everything about investments in economic growth suddenly changes. If you have money invested in the markets and you care about the future, the next step we're going to take really matters to you a lot. And that's giant step number two. We call this one the economy and energy. Economic growth depends on energy. Wow, there it is. It's this concept more than any other that serves to cast a light on the future, right? A very bright light. Out of all the economic charts and data I have, and I got a lot of them, I got quite a bit. This next one is really, it's the most robust, it's the rock solid, most rock solid of them all. It shows that economic growth, GDP, and that's how it's measured, and growth in energy consumption over the past 50 years have been tightly coupled. Now, there's a chart here at the site. It's actually titled GDP and energy are tightly coupled. This comes from Ugo Bardi's work, uh, and it's just graphing two things. On the y-axis, heading up and down, world GDP in trillions of dollars. On the x-axis, world energy consumption expressed in millions of tons of oil equivalent, right? So if, if 
because we got a lot of different, you know, we, we get fossil fuels, our, our coal, oil, natural gas. We've got, oh, nuclear. We've got, you know, um, hydro, some wind and some solar. But if you convert it all, each one of those into its oil equivalents, it makes it easy to express just a single thing. So it's total energy consumption expressed in oil and world GDP. And you know what you see? You get a nice straight line for the past 50 years from 1965 to 2016 a nice straight line and the data points all fall really very neatly either right on that straight red line or, or very close to it and what that tells us because it's a straight line is that there's a very tight relationship between global economic activity and global energy consumption the units can be defined if you want if you expect require or counting on demand x units of economic growth then this chart tells us you're going to need Y units of additional energy consumption. It's very simple. It's dead linear. There's nothing complicated about it. More economic growth is going to require more energy use. That's been true for the past 50 years. And there's nothing yet anywhere in the data to suggest that this has or will change. Now, this is a profoundly important concept. It matters to every investor, every saver, citizen, parent, grandparent who cares about preserving their wealth, and leaving behind a world worth inheriting, which is our mission at Peak Prosperity. And here's why. The economy and its enabler, the financial system, are 100% built around the idea of perpetual exponential growth. Well, as we pointed out above, that, or before, I should say, you're on, on a recording, that exponential economic growth is based on energy growth. Well, and that energy growth cannot continue forever, or maybe even for very much longer in this story. So now the operative question becomes, what happens to the linked economic and financial systems when they cannot grow exponentially anymore? It's a good question. Do they just level out? Do, do they you know, peacefully sort of turn into a stable sort of a system? What happens? Well, nobody really knows, but perhaps we got a taste of that back in 2008 when the financial system almost blew to smithereens. Do you remember, right? The entire banking system almost seized up and ceased to function. They were desperate times. Well, why? What happened? Simply, all of that almost broke because credit stopped growing exponentially for the first time since the 1950s. I'm showing here now a chart which shows total debt in the system because we have a debt-based monetary system. And this is data from the Federal Reserve. It comes from the FRED, the FRED website. And I'm showing here that there's from 1950 to 2019, we see here that there is this red line that's rising exponentially, except there's a little wiggle, a little wiggle there, right there around 2008 and nine. And at that little wiggle shows that credit actually went backwards a tiny, tiny little bit for about a year. Credit was actually going in reverse, and the whole system almost exploded. The whole system almost broke. I mean, really? We've built for ourselves a system of credit and money that's either happily growing, but exponentially growing, or it's collapsing? Those are its two states? <laughs> if you're like me, you find that a little bit troubling. So let's connect the dots here then. I'm leaving aside all sorts of profoundly worrying signals from the natural world, which I normally connect in the environment or ecological piece, right? The missing insects, we've got melting ice, we've got a hundred other signs that the age of growth is well and truly over, which is a whole other dot to connect here. But we're going to have to set that aside because for our purposes today, I think it's sufficient to just connect these two dots. One, the financial system requires exponential growth. Two, Fossil fuels are finite. You get that point one is dependent on this thing called infinite growth. Fossil fuels, which provide the growth in a very straight line, linear fashion, are finite. So we have financial system that wants infinity, and we got fossil fuels that are finite. Dot one, dot two, there's tension. That's the tension that's starting to show up. Most people aren't aware of this. 
they feel it in other ways. And so we have these divisive, increasingly fractured political debates and we have increasing suicides and we have people numbing themselves out with eating too much and playing video games and even suicide, whatever those, those markers of stress are. The real stress in the system is our common narrative. The thing that everything has been hooked to is this idea of how our economy is going to provide for us. But the economy doesn't provide anything actually for us. Really, it's the energy that provides those things for us. The economy is the way we, we, we parse that energy out. The energy in this story is beginning to dwindle and wind down. All right. One other point to weave in here to connect those two dots. So maybe it's, it's three dots I have to connect. Dot one was financial system requires exponential growth. Dot two, the source of that growth is fossil fuels, and those are finite. The third dot here is that currency, money, debt, things like that, they're not actually wealth, although we confuse them with wealth in the popular press all the time to the point that most people actually are confused and think of money and debts as wealth, but they're not. They're claims on wealth. And it's a, it's a very common thing to mistake money and debt as wealth. So and what do you mean debt as wealth? Well, if you own a billion dollars of U.S. Treasury notes, well, that's the debt of the U.S. government. But if you own that billion dollars of that and maybe a billion dollars of corporate bonds, right, you're said to be very wealthy. But what do you really own? Well, you own a billion dollars uh, plus interest, of course, of claims on the future cash flows of the issuers of those bonds. But the bonds themselves, they're not real wealth in the sense, you know, you can't eat them, you can't live in them, you can't do anything with them except maybe admire them in your portfolio. We own claims on wealth, things like cash, currency, uh, you know, bonds, stocks. We own those claims on wealth so we can someday consume or possess, possess actual wealth. To do anything useful with bonds in this example, you'd have to first convert them to dollars which are themselves liabilities of the Federal Reserve. And it's only once you've done this conversion that you can then exchange those dollars for the real goods and services that you actually consume, like houses and oil wells and land and gold, food, things like that. And that's the point. Everything we popularly call wealth today, currency, stocks, and bonds, they're actually merely claims on the final items containing real value that we wish to own or consume which means there always needs to be a balance between the claims on the one hand and the things on the other hand. Too few claims, we call that deflation. Too many, uh, that's inflation. Well, in this story, the Fed and other central banks, they've been fostering the exponential accumulation of claims at roughly twice the rate of real GDP growth. That's the things in this story. And without any indication of concern for the fact that the Earth is, you know, finite. So I've got a chart here. Uh, oh, it's the same chart as before, but I want you to take another look at it. The blue line on the bottom of this chart shows GDP, and it's kind of flat and trundling along, and it represents the real stuff. And then we've got the red line on top, which is exponentially shooting away from the blue line below. And when you see these two lines diverge on this chart, is it not completely totally, utterly obvious that the claims are increasing faster than the stuff. That's what those two diverging lines mean. The data shows that debts have been compounding at twice the rate of GDP growth and have been since 1971. Now, is that sustainable? Nope. How could it possibly work out? Well, one way. There is a way. And that way is only if GDP growth comes roaring back and is twice the pace of debt growth for many decades into the future. Now, how likely is that? Well, let me tell you a story about how energy and the economy are linked. Stop me if you've heard this story before, right? The only way this story resolves itself in the ways that everybody's hoping, dreaming, scheming, or just denying and failing to look at is if, and only if, rapid economic growth comes roaring out of the gate. That economic growth requires energy. Full stop. Nothing else needs to be said about that, except where's that energy going to come from? All you have to do is look into the energy data and you say, it's not there. It's not there. The easy stuff is gone. We worked through it. It's gone. Wow. This is such a simple story and it's so hard for most people to get their minds around. So I'm really glad we're going through it today because it's really important. It's really important. Now, 
constantly increasing debts, those are an implicit bet that the future is going to be larger than the present. Exponentially larger given the interest involved, right? Because we don't just have the debt itself. You, you know, the government doesn't owe you a billion dollars if you have a billion in treasury notes. They owe you the billion plus interest, right? So the interest involved is what drives the exponential behavior in this system. The real wealth to justify those claims is going to show up. That's, that's the implicit bet here. Magically. Well, it always has, Chris. Unfortunately, peak all sorts of things militates against that view. I've talked about a peak in energy coming out there, but we could be talking about a peak in mine output for copper, for lithium, silver, uh, peak amount of fish that can come out of the ocean, peak soil as we uh, degrade it and it, and it uh, goes into the oceans, uh, peak extraction of water from ancient aquifers, peak all sorts of things, right? We're running out of stuff all over the place, but our entire economy and financial system is geared for the idea that we're never going to run out of anything. In fact, we'll always be able to get more, more lumber, more fish, more soil, more soybeans, more everything. And I guess what I'm saying here is that the commonly held conventional view of the world and the future has got it all wrong, dangerously and very badly wrong. Just because they've had it wrong doesn't mean you have to get it wrong. This is where the education comes in. This is where having the appropriate context and awareness and education around these things is really, really important. And that's why I do the work I do. And that's why you're listening today is to get that understanding. Now, I want to talk to you about the vital role of hard assets in this story, because, OK, you might be asking, all right, well, Chris, what's to be done here? What should I do? The solution is to understand that human nature has not changed at all in the past 5000 years. Hasn't done a nope, no, no evolution has occurred, which means that when confronted with such a major development as the one I've laid out in this story, the normal human tendency will be to ignore it as long as possible and then do some really dumb things to try and prevent reality from intruding on the fantasy. What have humans done hundreds of times throughout history when their dreams were economically unworkable? Well, they printed or debased their money. Can't afford a war? Clip the coins. Empire too large? Go into debt and then print your way out of that later. Global economy no longer growing? Debt's too large? And the claims are too many? Quantitative easing or QE. Really, there's nothing new under the sun here. Same old, same old, right? To, what you're living through today has happened hundreds of times in history. And it's happened because humans are humans. That's it. Has, that's, the, that's the primary defect in the story if you want one. In every case, when the solution, air quotes around that, I guess, solution, was printing or its equivalent, fortunes were made and lost, but mostly lost. Claims on wealth were mistaken for actual wealth. And people clung to those claims. And when the claims evaporated in various panics, the holders were financially ruined. Now, that's going to happen again for the same human reasons as before, only this time it's a global phenomenon. There are no borders to scurry across and hide out while things blow over. More importantly, there are no new continents to go to with fresh, tasty, untapped natural resources to exploit. Now, seen from a comfortable distance, what actually happens during those times is a wealth transfer from those who don't see it coming to those who do. Broadly speaking, from those clinging on to the claims on wealth towards those who actually hold the real wealth. Now, this is where hard assets come in. The real wealth, again, there's the real things that are either the sources of real wealth, right? The primary sources of real wealth. This is farmland, oil wells, mines, timberlands, etc. Or are the tangible things that come from those assets. That's the refined gold or silver or lithium, copper, it's lumber, it's cash flowing real estate, things like that. By far, the simplest and easiest thing you can do as a starting point is to have a portion, a diversified portion of your wealth safely tucked into gold and silver. And I'm bringing this up because it's, it's simple. It's easy. Like a couple of mouse clicks and you're done, right? By the way, the big smart money has already started this process, which means you better get moving if you want to join that parade. There may well come a day when the big money floods in that direction and then, hey, good luck finding any right? Uh, here's why. Here's some data for you. For a variety of reasons, too numerous to go into here. 
Uh, this is a whole other podcast at some point. The world central banks are now too far down the QE rabbit hole to do anything but print and then print and then print some more. That's They're locked in that dynamic. Nothing they can do till this blows up. This has resulted in over $15 trillion of negative yielding debt across the world. Now, this is a concept that I go into much more deeply in the next uh, companion piece to this, which is for subscribers. Now, that $15 trillion number, it's exploding and sure to go even higher in the future. You know, it was only $6 trillion uh, less than a year ago. It's just exploding. It looks vertical right now. And if you, if you personally were forced to choose between the certain losses of negative yields, and by the way, negative yields, that's why I had to spend a whole piece uh, exploring this. It's such a weird concept. I can't even believe we're here. It's ridiculous. Negative yield means that you pay an entity to lend that entity money, right? So if you had to choose between paying the Swiss government for the right to lend it money for a while, if you had to choose between that and holding gold, which at least offers, what, a zero yield, at least it's zero, it's not negative, which is more attractive? Well, the answer screams own gold to many investors, which explains this next chart, which compares the, it's a chart of the total amount of negative yielding debt, which is going up and down and up and down and, you know, spiking all over the place. And now, whew, finally off to over 16, 15 trillion, heading towards 16 trillion. Uh, and the price of gold, you see that those two charts line up really, really well. That is, the more negative yielding debt out, is out there, the higher the price of gold goes. And when it goes down, vice versa. Because it, that's one thing that gold does is it offers you the chance to protect yourself from negative yielding debt. Uh, so uh, that, that, that makes sense. Uh, gold has another function, which we'll get to in a minute. Now, look, I have three adult children who I'm a, I love very much. And while I don't have any grandchildren yet, hey, I already love them too. And because I do, I own lots of gold and silver. I've taken the time to study history, clear my head of the common narrative that has so many things so desperately wrong. And I actively reject, this is an active mental process, I actively reject the usual anti-gold propaganda that infects the U.S. financial press. It's a weird position. I don't know why they do it. It's not reflected or repeated anywhere else in the world. And I don't have a good explanation for it. But you can detect it in Wall Street Journal articles, which have all these negative nouns and adjectives sort of like, you know, sprinkled all around their articles when they talk about gold. And you can practically see the journalists sneering as they write the word gold and they use pejorative terms like gold bugs, bugs, right? Um, at any rate, I actively reject that stuff because it's not useful uh, information for me to absorb that anti-gold propaganda. And I take it as my role to provide my as yet unborn grandchildren with as solid a start as I can. I take that role seriously, the same as many other families do. A core position in gold and silver, physical gold and silver, not ETFs, not miners, not anything like that. It, those have a different role, but core position in physical gold and silver is an essential part of that strategy for me. It's the durable insurance fund that a financial fire cannot destroy. If you love your family, and you take the role of providing and protecting seriously, gold and silver, silver are their critical must-haves in your holdings. After that, the next layers involve putting my assets, my financial assets, into productive real estate, such as farmland, my resilient homestead, excellent equities, including miners, if that's your thing, and other hard assets. What makes sense for you course, is a complex equation that involves your age, your financial status, geographical function and location, family circumstances, all that. We strongly advise that any money that you do have in the financial markets or markets, as we like to call them, due to their excessively deformed nature, we advise that you have that money be managed by people who understand these many risks and actively manage for you the future, for the future that you think is coming. Our endorsed financial advisors at New Harbor Financial, they'll be glad to provide you with a free, no obligation consultation as they have for many very satisfied hundreds of our readers. They will help you develop a plan, determine which assets make the most sense to explore and invest in. Literally nothing's off the table. Uh, you can talk to them about anything. Finally, be sure to discuss these powerful and important ideas with those you love and care about. The world is changing in a really profound and powerful way. And people will either be prepared for those changes 
or they will be caught unawares. This isn't doom and gloom. It's just reality. It's data. However, as has been historically true, reality, data, things like that aren't very popular with the masses. And that's why so much opportunity exists. And to see all of this, you just have to take two giant steps back to understand the larger picture. One is to look at the exponential use of fossil fuels, and the second is to understand the relationship of how the economy and our financial system depend on energy. That brings us to the end of part one. In part two, defending against the global currency crisis, we take an in-depth look at the the brewing global currency crisis. Uh, It's all in the charts right there. I got a lot of data in this next part and how the it really just how panicked the world central banks uh how the panicked central banks they're going to make it worse. They just will. Futile desperate rescue attempts. They painted themselves into a really difficult corner and they're just going to slop more paint around and it's it could get ugly. The sudden changes in global capital flows that are going to occur this is what's going to throw the world into chaos. So we explore what that global financial system looks like. Understanding that is really critical. And the wealth destruction that's going to ensue is going to be much larger than most analysts and investors can even comprehend. An absolutely essential requirement for preserving wealth during this period will be holding it in forms that cannot be inflated away by a runaway printing press. That brings us to the end of this podcast. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you prosper and enjoy the future.